the unknown, how much still lies behind this barrier. Men and women devote their lives to a search for its secrets. Among them, the scientist who finds in this unknown his challenge. Early signs and flashing lights in the master control room indicate that every piece of apparatus is ready and in working order. Ten seconds to 5.20 a.m. Five seconds, four, three, two, one, zero. What you've just seen is an atomic explosion, an everyday, ordinary atomic bomb, releasing a terrific amount of energy and causing a terrific amount of destruction. Now, if we were to take, say, uh, half a million gallons of gasoline, we'd have the same amount of power. But not only is the atomic bomb used as a weapon of destruction, it can be used as peacetime power, perhaps to uh, provide power for the lights in the city or uh, maybe to power our boats, ships, as we know a submarine. But before we get into this area of atomic research and atomic power, I'd like you to meet two gentlemen. First of all, Dr. Adolf Voigt of the Ames Laboratory. He's a nuclear chemist or a radio chemist, whichever you so choose to call him. And uh, next to Dr. Voigt is our science host, Dr. Goetz, head of the chemistry department here at Iowa State College. Dr. Voigt, what is the difference in the usage of uh, atomic energy for uh, the atomic bomb versus the usage uh, in peacetime needs. And before we actually get into that, what is an atom? Well, Jake, an atom is the smallest amount of matter that a person can have that still looks like matter. But uh, don't get me wrong, we can't see it. It would take uh, 30, I think, trillions of them to uh, cover the head of a pin. The, uh, but if we enlarge these atoms to the point that we could see them, they might look something like uh, this, uh, not with labels on them, but this represents an atom in any case, an atom of uranium. And as you know, uh, without uranium, we wouldn't have atomic power. Now, atomic power in explosions or for uh, the generation of useful power is produced in this way. We take another little thing, we call it a neutron. It's a small uh, particle which is uh, not found in nature, but which can be made very easily. And with that, we bombard this uranium. And in the process, the uranium splits into two large pieces with the release of this tremendous energy we've been talking about. In addition to that energy and these two large pieces that are called fission products, uh, there are uh, neutrons, additional neutrons, liberated. And these hold the key to the whole process of the release of power for useful or destructive purposes. If we use these neutrons to strike other uranium atoms, uh, if we use each one of these neutrons, we can uh, get in every cycle a larger and larger number of uranium atoms involved. If we make this happen in a very small fraction of a second, we get this power released all at once, as in the atomic bomb. If, however, we uh, absorb a couple of these neutrons and only let one of them go from one cycle to the next, we can have a, a slow uh, regulated release of power that can be used for peaceful purposes. All right, now let me see if I have this straight, Dr. Boyd. We start out with a unit here, uh, an amount, an atom of uh, uranium. We have a neutron, and we, uh, with this neutron, we clobber this atom of uranium. Uh, Byproducts are given off, fission products, as you call them in your line of business. Uh, we're not concerned with those right now. What we are concerned with are the neutrons that are given off by this uh, hitting of the uranium atom by another neutron. And, and these neutrons, in turn, hit more uranium atoms. And more neutrons are given off, and more and more. If this happens all at once, we have an atomic explosion. Yes. But if we control the amount of neutrons that we allow to attack this, these atoms of uranium, then we can control 
the amount of energy given off, and we uh, have a system for providing power. Is that right? That's right. Uh, Jake, it uh, might be well to go back to your uh, uh, gasoline comparison. You commented uh, that uh, atomic bomb had uh, about uh, as much power in it as a half a million gallons of gasoline. Well, now, you could take this half a million gallons of gasoline and evaporate it, mix it with the right amount of air, and touch it off, and you would have a big explosion, too, just as you do with the atomic mm -hmm. bomb. But, as you know, you can take this half a million gallons of gasoline, feed it into a carburetor of a gasoline engine, and get a steady flow of power. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, that half million gallons of gasoline is enough gasoline to run a motor car 500 times around the world. Mm -hmm. So you see here with this uh, uranium fuel, if you control these neutrons and let them flow gradually and steadily into uh, other uranium atoms, you can get this splitting and a steady flow of power so that a pound of uranium can give a very, very large amount of energy, too, over a very long period of time. For instance, as is used on, uh, what is this submarine that we saw christened on? The Nautilus, uh, Mamie Eisenhower uh, christened it on television. Did you see that, Dr. Yes, Yanks? I saw that. She almost uh, missed. <laughs> no, nah, she didn't miss. Uh, Mamie did a very good job. I think the Yanks will be signing her up. She laid down a very beautiful bunch. She <laughs> hauled off there, and when it started to move, she cracked it. Could be. It looked like a near miss to me. The uh, submarine is one form of one way of getting this power out. But uh, the problems that we're concerned with uh, are not uh, quite uh, tied in so close to that submarine as you might think. That is, the submarine is a, a vessel of military importance, and uh, economics don't enter into the picture very much. For one thing, these fission products we've been talking about have the property of absorbing these neutrons. And while you want a certain number of those neutrons absorbed, you uh, don't want to absorb all of them, or else your process will die. So that you have to get rid of these fission products. In the case of the submarine fuel, they, this can be taken out and put into a, a taken out from the submarine and, and reprocessed in some laboratory at considerable expense. In the case of, that we're interested in uh, for civilian power, uh, this process has to be made cheap so that this civilian power can compete with other sources of power. And uh, this is one of your, this is your uh, field then, isn't it? This is one problem that is being worked on in the Ames Laboratory in which uh, the group that we're associated with is uh, uh, working on. Well, how about this idea of radiation? These fission products are uh, very highly radioactive materials. And uh, to illustrate radioactivity, the Geiger counter here is the usual method for measuring radioactive materials. I have here a sample of, of radioactive phosphorus, which uh, produces its uh, results in the Geiger counter, as you can see. <laughs> the, but I now don't have to go to anything quite as uh, <laughs> bad as uh, the, uh, as quite as different as radioactive phosphorus. All of us has a certain amount of radioactivity connected with us. Would you, I? You, mm, Charlie, uh, in your body and also in your radium dial wristwatch. Charlie's got a good money out. for that watch. I'm hot stuff. <laughs> yeah, this, his has got yours beat all hollow. Now this uh, radiation, one is always concerned with this radiation because uh, you've all heard stories about how harmful it can be in large quantities. But uh, radiation is all around us. We have uh, radiation from the sun uh, and other kinds of radiation that we deal with every day. Uh, sunlight can itself be uh, dangerous if you get too much of it. The uh, rays from the sun will uh, strike the body and produce a pleasant tan in a short time, but if you take them over too long a period of time, this uh, process mm -hmm. will become uh, so uh, we'll go in so far that you get sick from it. Uh, Another uh, type of radiation that people are very familiar with is the X-ray. This is an X-ray tube. Dr. Fassel's tube, isn't it? Yes, it's the same tube that Fassel had on his show. And in this case, the, uh, it's more penetrating than sun rays. As you know, the sun will give you a surface tan and a sunburn, chemical reaction taking place, as Adolf says. But with the X-rays, it penetrates all the way through the body. So these chemical upset chemical reactions. In other words, you have chemical reactions going on in your body, the building of cells and so on, are all chemical actions. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, these x-rays will disturb these and make you sick, create cancer. At the same time, it can be used to destroy cancer cells. In other words, these, this radiation can be good and bad depending on control and, and that's right. good. The uh, radium is another source of radiation. It's a radioactive material, uh, very much like the radioactive materials that come from the uh, atomic explosion. Uh, radium is normally carried around in a lead pot, such as this one, and uh, handled by means of, of tongs. Maybe I can pick that up. Those are Dr. Getz's mustache tweezers, by the way. Did you know that? <laughs> well, uh, this, uh, I wouldn't handle this this closely if it were really radium, but uh, like a lot of the other things uh, that you might see, this is a stand-in. Yeah, we usually use table salt on this program. That's what it is. But the, uh, <coughs> in any case, the radium is handled in, in uh, a way in which uh, to protect the person who's handling it. And it is this uh, matter of protection of the personnel that is, one of the chief worries of the radiochemist and the person who supervises radiochemists because he has to see that they are uh, adequately protected from these radiations even when they handle them in quantities that that uh, might be dangerous if they didn't use the uh, these protections well just with sunshine you have the same problem with uh, radi other radiations for example the sunshine uh, 10 or 15 minutes of sunshine is good uh, but you stay in it for several hours and you get very sick from sunburn Mm -hmm. By the same right. token, uh, one can uh, work with radioactive chemicals for a few minutes without harm, but you don't want to get it under your fingernails and carry it around for several days or inhale it. Now, our radio director here, our TV director, excuse me, uh, this is a simulated glove box. Uh, he took the box away so that uh, you can see what goes here. on. Mm -hmm. But uh, here now, Adolf is going to mix two chemicals, which... Uh, <coughs> The thing uh, creates a puff. Now, if this fog was radioactive material, we'd be in trouble. We'd have to get out of here real quick and probably it'd take several days, if not weeks, before this place could be decontaminated so it'd be safe. And if we inhale those, get them in our lungs, we'd be <coughs> sick ducks or uh, uh, maybe dead ducks before too long. Smells like we should leave uh, right now. Well, you see, this was a simulated box. We didn't have a box. And uh, uh, these, rubber, hands out of these, these rubber gloves here that uh, Adolf's getting out of uh, protects from getting it on his hand. Now we're over to a real the, box here. They don't protect you from your lungs, whereas the, the real box that we have here will uh, do both protect it, from get, keep it from getting in your hands, and because it's enclosed, it will keep it from getting in your lungs as well. I see they're using most of the cow these days. <laughs> uh, one of the things, uh, Jake, you notice this box is completely enclosed. Now, normally you'll have ventilation and filters, mm -hmm. so this air is being changed in here. But we don't have that fancy deal here. Now, he's going to mix these same chemicals in here. Now, you see they're retained in the box so that uh, he's not getting it on his hands because his hands are in rubber gloves, and we're not having to breathe there. So that uh, this is a matter of protection. This is one of the true tools of the radiochemist. Without it, he wouldn't be able to work with a lot of materials. Now, this is a complete laboratory in itself, though. I see we have electrical outlets. We have a centrifuge in the bottom, uh, light enclosed there. And uh, imagine you could have exhaust vents on it and everything. Yes, there you? are normally exhaust vents and filters to filter out this dust so that the air can be uh, let out to the atmosphere without endangering anybody outside of the uh, system itself. Well, how does someone such as you, uh, Dr. Voigt, get started in the field of uh, nuclear chemistry? Well, when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, uh, the field of nuclear chemistry was a little bit newer and less known at that time than it is now, and it seemed to be a fascinating field in which uh, to do one's work. And uh, at that uh, time, we worked with uh, a, an atom smasher, a thing called a cyclotron, and uh, produced new kinds of, of atoms. Uh, you know there are uh, 98 uh, elements as we know them, 98 different kinds of, of atoms that exist in nature on the periodic chart on the periodic chart uh, but these for these various atoms exist in many forms all of them have some forms that are normal and and calm and collected and some forms that are highly excited and and uh, uh, give off radiation and th these are the ones that we call radioactive and the job of the radiochemist is to uh, work out the nature the relationships of these uh, atoms to each other their uh, behavior how long they live uh, how much energy they give off when they decay, and, and all sorts of, of properties like that.
Well, where well, did you do your undergraduate work? At uh, Pomona College in California. Pomona? I'm, I'm a Californian by birth. You see, Adolf is a very important statistic. You don't have many people coming from California to Iowa. You have no. a lot of people going from Iowa to California. I understand that you grew up in a lemon patch or a lemon uh, farm. Groves, they call them out Groves. there. Groves. Yeah, this, this accounts in some way for my sour disposition. Oh, see. But uh, the uh, research that a radiochemist does is connected with uh, this matter of finding out what atoms belong where in the, in the isotope chart and also with the use of these atoms in different kinds of research. And uh, one of the uh, jobs that I have is that of teaching courses in the use of radioactive tracers in agricultural uh, research, biological research, and engineering research here on the campus. By the way, Adolf, a while ago when you were working with the Geiger counter, uh, you uh, talked about radioactive phosphorus. Uh, this is a very important research uh, chemical uh, that is being used to study plant growth, nutrition, see phosphorus is an important nutrient in soils, and uh, uh, the people that are working in this new field have to be trained to work safely. They have to learn to work with boxes such as these and learn what's safe and what's not safe. And in addition to teaching these people, uh, Dr. Voigt's group has a responsibility for rendering service around the campus to help people uh, work safely with this material. You see, Adolf, is, uh, like uh, many others of us, has a lot of titles. He's a uh, professor of chemistry. He's assistant to the director of the Institute for Atomic Research. He's an associate to scientist in the Ames Laboratory. And uh, just like with the rest of us, they trade titles for salary. <laughs> when did you come to Iowa State College? Dr. In 1942, when the, uh, about the time of the uh, wartime research on atomic energy started here at at the college. And you worked with Dr. Spedding and Dr. Wilhelm and Dr. Fassel and some of the yes, other gentlemen. Yes, I'm still you know working with them in the various research projects. The, uh, I'd like to make one point clear with regard to the general use of radioactive materials in uh, research, and that is that for most uh, research uh, involving radioactive tracers, this kind of uh, elaborate equipment is not necessary. Usually you're dealing with a level in which a normal laboratory will be adequate for, for the research. But in certain special problems, uh, particularly these problems re relating to power, you do need this uh, elaborate equipment. You see, if we go back to the general theme that we started with, uh, Jake, uh, we talked about these ashes from the uh, atomic furnace. Yeah. These ashes, you know, absorb these neutrons. And the controlling of the neutrons uh, is the controlling of our power plant. It's like putting down your foot feed on your automobile. You feed more gasoline in, you slack off, you feed less gasoline in. And uh, uh, by the same token, we have to control these, these neutrons. And these ashes, although they uh, are helpful in some ways to slow this engine down so we don't have an explosion, they can also put it out. And when you get to high levels of radiation, such as these, uh, these uh, so-called ashes have, then you have to get into more protective equipment than these boxes. These, uh, these boxes are not much protection. Now here's a intermediate step. There. An intermediate step, uh, this is normally placed in a glove box with a lead shield in front. And uh, rather on that side in front, you're, you're the operator there. And uh, Adolf, the you tell him how to work this. Yeah, this is, uh, you normally view this through two inches of lead, lead glass shielding and two inches of lead so that uh, radiation which would uh, penetrate through that other stuff uh, is blocked by it. You're doing very well so far, Jake. I've practiced enough, I must admit. You got that connected to the right bottle, so you're going to get some reagent. He's this out. is the way in which one would add reagent to a, to a uh, system. Down underneath here is a, a well for a centrifuge, which would be present in the, in the box itself. Then when you want to let go... You're dribbling, Jake. Well, I stopped squeezing the bulb. Something must be squeezing it. Now you've got that squeezed underneath it so Pinched. it can't get back up. It's all right. Okay. Now I got this far, but what happens now? Now you push that black button. This one here? Yeah. Uh oh, Jake, you'd better keep with television. I don't believe you're going to make a good chemist. Uh, I'm getting radiated all over now. That's right. That's just water. Don't let it worry you. But you see, if that were radioactive, uh, it would have to be contained inside of safety means. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to learn to manipulate things without breakage, and when you get to high-level radiation, such as we have with these ashes in the atomic furnace, 
you'll have a real problem. Yes, for this uh, purpose, for the purpose of handling these things, uh, an area was recently completed in the research building, uh, which we call the Hot Canyon. This uh, Hot Canyon has a, an eight inch uh, steel shield with eight inch lead glass windows. And uh, this was uh, largely designed here and uh, built by our engineering department under the direction of Ray Fisher and uh, largely engineered by Gordon Winders. This uh, is something we're quite proud of in the laboratory. We feel that uh, it will uh, do a lot of jobs for us. The manipulators that you see are handled on the outside of this wall by uh, workers, and the motions of, that the worker goes through are duplicated on the inside by the fingers of the manipulator. The story you have seen is true. Only the ions have been changed to protect the chemist. And that's about it. Like science fiction, it's a wonderful story. Well, uh, Jake, uh, we try not to be uh, too serious as chemists, but uh, sometimes uh, hard uh, to think about your subject and be here on the television set and uh, not get a little tied up. Well, before we go into our closing, I'd like to want you to mention one more thing, or have you. I don't think we've mentioned what we're wearing right here. These are gadgets to measure the amount of radiation that a person might receive. It's a matter of protection uh, to uh, prevent him from getting 
uh, too much at any time. This is a, a pocket chamber. This is a film badge. They're used for the same uh, duplicate, uh, for the same purpose of measuring radiation. Uh, as far as we're concerned, they're just properties. I'd like to uh, sort of uh, summarize for you, Jake, what we were trying to put across tonight. Uh, we, of course, have this, this new tool, this uranium that breaks down to give off neutrons and power. If this is allowed to take place in a fraction of a second, you liberate tremendous quantities of power, and we have the atomic bomb, Boom. which everyone is familiar with now. We, that, that's old stuff. And the uh, new thing now is to harness this for domestic use. Now, it takes time, and it takes a lot of basic chemical research in order to come up with these answers. Now, in the case of Dr. Voigt, our guest for the evening, he's an expert in this field of radiochemistry. His uh, uh, field of studying these some 900 active isotopes and these ashes that are formed when uranium splits to give off this power uh, creates his challenge. Uh, incidentally, this problem that uh, they're working on now, uh, this civilian use that industrial people are interested in, uh, stems back from basic research that was done way back early in the Manhattan District Project uh, during the war. And it's because of the know-how and the experience that it was shown at that time that the money is being given to the laboratory to uh, carry on this work. Now, uh, 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 the proposition of uh, taking these uh, uh, radioactive ashes out of the uh, firebox is not a simple thing. It's a very complicated chemical operation. We've passed it over lightly night, saying, well, we take it back to the laboratory in the case of the uh, uh, war machine, the submarine, uh, wherein cost is not the primary item. But if you're going to have a domestic use, you've got to learn to do this on the job and do it quickly. And it's this job at the present time that uh, Dr. Boyd and Dr. Dana and Dr. Spedding and other people are doing. And uh, the basic work back of this is Dr. Boyd's real challenge this is one typical application of present basic research. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Getz and Dr. Adolph Voigt. Next week, Dr. Hickson of Iowa State College will be our guest. Dr. Hickson is former head of the chemistry department. The chemistry of corn provides for this scientist his challenge.